I miss you. I held off on getting a cell phone for as long as possible. I didn't really have a good reason, I guess, other than the cost. When I was just setting out on my own, there was no way I could afford the monthly plan. I was the only one of my friends to still rely on a landline. And it drove everyone nuts. I managed to wait until my 25th birthday, when I finally felt financially secure enough to justify buying one for myself. My friends all laughed about my change of heart, but I could tell they were relieved. And to be honest, I was pretty pleased too. As it turns out, cell phones are ridiculously convenient. Who knew? I didn't start getting the texts until about a month after I bought my phone. It was the first message from an unknown number that I'd received, and it read simply, I miss you. I was confused at first. I mean, what kind of introductory text was that? It seemed a little overdramatic to me, and that was when I made the connection. About a year ago, I dumped a deadbeat ex-boyfriend out of my life. Looking back, I can definitely say that he was really something of an overgrown child. He expected me to cook, clean, set up his doctor's appointments, and give him, yes, give him, half of my income each month. And he did not find it necessary to get a job. I shouldn't have stayed with him for as long as I did. Damn those devilishly good looks. But once I came to my senses, I kicked him to the curb. As all of his other boyfriends, or victims, had done before. My guess was that he'd stalked my Facebook or prodded my friends for my new number. After all, that wasn't the first time that he'd tried to reach out to me, and I figured it wouldn't be the last. In the end, I chose not to answer. For one, I knew he would just try to manipulate me if I gave him the chance, as per usual. For two, it would give me petty satisfaction to let him feel ignored and unheard. Now, as a rule, I try not to be petty, but sometimes such a perfect opportunity is just too seductive. The next few months seemed to corroborate my inference. His attacks weren't constant, but were always vague pleas that seemed to indicate that he needed a new host to leech off and couldn't find one. It was unsurprising that he tried to reach out to me first as I'd been the most loyal and long-lasting of all of his boyfriends. And the most... naive? That was the perfect target. The messages were always in the same vein, and quickly became tiresome. I miss you. I wish I could see you. I thought I saw you in a crowd today, but it turned out to just be a dream. Ugh. Pathetic. One night, about eight months since I'd had my phone, I slipped up. I have to admit, I'd been drinking. It had started as one beer to help me unwind after work and quickly snowballed into a one-man party. I was thoroughly smashed when I received a much longer text than usual. I miss you so much. I know you don't read these, but today of all days, I need you to know how much I love you. I'd do anything to see you one more time. Today of all days? days, I wondered. I tried to wade through the mushy haze of my brain. The first thought I had, I seized. Today must have been our anniversary. Sure, why not? It would be the perfect opportunity for a little manipulation. He was a prick, but he was smart. And then I had an idea. He wants to play games? Okay, let's play, but I'm going to change the rules. I swear... My thoughts slurred. I began to type, and my autocorrect struggled to clarify my drunkenness. If you want to come see me, then why don't you do it? And then, for good measure, I let him know that I knew he'd been investigating me. You know where to find me. I sent it. And with that, I changed fate. When I woke up the next morning, I had 13 missed calls. I tried to remember through the throbbing of my skull just what bullshit I'd done the night before. I groaned when my texting history answered my question. Well, at least I hadn't answered the phone, I thought. I silently prayed that he wouldn't message or call again, but I feared that I'd merely succeeded in egging him on. To my great relief, he stopped messaging me. For a week or so, my phone was blissfully free from his assaults. I was secretly satisfied, congratulating my drunken self on his ingenuity. 
and then the next week, I received a knock on my door. I opened it only to reveal a man of the badge, his solemn face and blue uniform standing stark in the morning sunlight. His partner stood behind him, his face hard as stone. I felt a strange coldness seep into my veins as they stared at me. Um, good morning, officers. Is there something wrong? I asked. With very little introduction, they invited themselves inside. I let them in, not sure what they were looking for, but positive they wouldn't find it. I figured they'd made a mistake, and was even more surprised when they began firing questions. Do you know anyone by the name of Silence Madison? I was stumped, completely puzzled. I can't say that I do, why? We found a series of texts to you on her phone. We found only one reply from you. The younger officer pulled out a printout of the texts that I had been receiving, and along with my one drunken reply, reality started to dawn on me as the older officer said, Did you receive these messages? Yeah, I answered. I added quickly, but they were coming from an unknown number. I thought they were from an ex-boyfriend. And that's why you sent that reply. I was sweating nervously. Well, yeah. I, I thought it would make him stop. I couldn't stop running my mouth. I, I, was, I was a little drunk, so maybe it, it wasn't the best decision. The younger officer stepped outside as the older one sighed. There seems to be a rather unfortunate accident. What do you mean? He took a deep breath and opened his mouth. Silence had had a very rough first year of college. Classes were hard. She didn't quite fit in. Her life was a mess of stress and papers, and just when she thought it couldn't get any worse, her best friend since childhood, Rochelle Wagner, died in a car wreck. The death was instant, but Silence's pain was not. She had withdrawn into herself as the semester went on. Her family and friends mourn Rochelle's loss, but they continue their lives, as people are wont to do. Silence, on the other hand, could not bring herself to leave her friend in the past. She tried to deal with it, she really did. She looked for outlets, she tried to put on a happy face when she went to class, but she sank slowly into a darkness that felt inescapable. And when the darkness was truly thick, suffocating, insufferable. She'd text Rochelle's old number. A useless gesture, but sometimes it would bring her comfort. And on the anniversary of Rochelle's death, when she was at her lowest, she finally got a response. If you want to come see me, then why don't you do it? You know where to find me. She tried calling, but she didn't even reach voicemail because I'd never set it up. So she'd done the only logical thing she could do. She reached for the box cutter that she'd swiped from work and opened her veins to the possibility of infinity. I made a terrible mistake that night, a mistake that ended the life of someone desperately struggling just above the surface. And her father forgave me, but no matter how many times I apologized, her mother had nothing but hatred for me. I understood that. To her, I had been the final push to kill her daughter. The police told me over and over that Silence herself had ended her own life. I was not to blame, but inside me. The seeds of guilt spread far across my heart, growing like weeds that I couldn't root. It was a long hard year. I managed to get back on my feet and continue on with my life, although Silence's death hung over me like a shadow. No matter what I did, I just couldn't forget her. No matter how far away the incident seemed. Yesterday was her anniversary. I tried my best to get through the day, pretending I, I'd never heard that name, never heard that story. It was all going well, until about 10 that night, when I received a text, a 
text from a number I'd been trying desperately to forget for the entirety of that year. Thank you.